a privilege to be on the show tonight. Uh, and as uh, I think you know that our group, the Mantis Collection, it has been built around conservation and education. And uh, the lady you're going to hear tonight has helped us to develop that ethic a long way. So Taryn, after completing her honors degree in zoology and working in Lupopo and the Caprivi, Taryn joined the Mantis family in 2008 at Chamwari Game Reserve. And in 2009, she took over the Game Re Ranger School at Chamwari. She loves tracking wildlife in the bush and became the first woman cyber tracker, tracking evaluator in the world. Congratulations, Taryn. Together with Mantis, Taryn has spearheaded the development of our conservation program, both in the Victoria Falls in Mauritius, and that's only to name a few. Taryn manages our Wildlife Impact Experience Division, which includes worldwide experience and specializes in wildlife conservation travel for gap year student volunteers. She has grown a team of passionate people who are all dedicated and qualified in conservation. They're all on this call tonight. The team are looking at further opportunities, including our Zambezi Queen collection of houseboats in Namibia at the Kripiri and our Hopewell Conservation Estate in Port Elizabeth. Please enjoy this talk. Taryn is very passionate about reconnecting people with nature through travel with a purpose. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, Taryn. Okay, thank you, Adrian, for that introduction. It's certainly been an incredible journey with yourself and Mantis. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you to LCA for this opportunity. I'm so excited to share how you can get involved in making a difference for our planet by volunteering at our wildlife conservation projects in various countries. I have some of our team members in the audience to help answer questions as we go in the chat box. So please look out for Claire, Bianca and David. And a bit later in the talk, you'll be hearing from two of our ambassadors, Michaela and Daniel, who have traveled with us several times. I believe much of the audience today are members of our youth, which is brilliant because you are tomorrow's leaders and change makers. I'm sure I don't need to explain that the natural world, our planet is in trouble. I recently watched Sir David Attenborough's witness statement documentary, A Life on Earth, and I highly recommend, actually strongly urge everyone to, to watch it. It's very inspiring, very eye-opening. So a bit about our company worldwide experience. We're all about connecting people with nature in a way that is impactful. And that's both for conservation as well as for our travelers. So for our travelers, it really is the adventure of a lifetime while they get to travel with purpose. We have several wildlife conservation projects, mainly in South Africa, but also in Namibia, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, Croatia, and Scotland. Worldwide Experience was founded back in 2002 by Paul Gardner at our Shamwari Game Reserve and it's today run by a small team of very passionate conservationists. Our team all have conservation related qualifications and experience in the field and what we really pride ourselves on is that we offer experiences that are ethical and authentic. So when people travel with us, they have peace of mind that they really are making a difference at the projects. Before I touch on a few of the projects, I think it's important just to briefly discuss why conservation is so important. And wildlife conservation, it's a much broader topic and it's not just about the wildlife, it's about protecting their habitats to maintain healthy wildlife species and populations and restoring and protecting natural ecosystems. A very important word which has become a bit of a buzzword lately is biodiversity. And that just basically refers to the variety of life on earth. I like to think of biodiversity as a web of life encompassing the earth and all life, including humans, are dependent on the health of this biodiversity web. Just like we're all dependent on a healthy ozone layer and just like the ozone layer can have holes punched into it because of human activities, so can the web of life. So in this very simplistic diagram, it's um, a lot more involved and complex in reality. 
But in this diagram, all the species represent the knots or nodes in the web, and the strands of web existing between these species represents the connections and relationships between all the species. And if we just lose one node, like this particular grass species over here that's connected to some, some grazers and other plants, then all the strands connecting it to the other nodes also fall away, leaving a gaping hole. And the more and more gaping holes there are, this, the more weakened the overall web becomes. And when enough nodes and connections are lost, the web of life can collapse and whole ecosystems have collapsed as well. But if we do what we can to nurture nature today, the planet can still thrive. So how do we make a difference at Mantis and Worldwide? to do our small part in supporting healthy biodiversity, we connect travelers and nature in a meaningful way. Through recruiting self-funded volunteers, we support and run various conservation projects which preserve habitat for wild plants and animals, create awareness about conservation challenges, engage with communities to find solutions and explore ways for humans to coexist peacefully with nature. We believe that only once people have really experienced and learned about and deeply connected with nature, can we truly understand and appreciate it and care for it in a way that will inspire us to take care of it. And this is what inspires us to take action. Our conservation program categories um, fall into to several categories. The wildlife conservation projects, these tend to be focused on a particular species or a particular region. Our wildlife conservation program in Namibia, this is run by the Elephant Human Relations Aid. It's an NGO based on the ground that have been doing great work over there. We also support animal sanctuaries and rehabilitation centers. And these are basically for wildlife that have unfortunately come into conflict with humans. Um, and the number one goal is to rehabilitate them and rewild these species but unfortunately not all species can be rehabilitated and released back into the wild, usually because they're too habituated to humans or they're too injured. There's several reasons why this could happen. And in that case, the sanctuary then becomes their forever home. Our game reserve projects are based very heavily on research and wildlife monitoring. And that's really a behind the scenes experience of what it takes to run a game reserve in a protected area and there's a big aspect of conservation management and community engagements as well. Then we have our marine conservation projects. We've got a couple in South Africa, and these are focused on ocean research and creating awareness about the importance of the marine ecosystems for life on earth. And this is also heavily connected with community engagements. Our Vets Go Wild program, this is specifically for vet students, whether you're studying to be a veterinary doctor, a vet nurse or a vet technician. We run a 16 day module specifically for, for vet students. And this is led by Dr. William Folds and Dr. Emily Baxter. Vets Go Wild was actually co-founded by Dr. William Folds and our CEO, Paul Gardner back in 2007. And we've had over 500 students come through the program and it's really been a life-changing program, as you will hear from Michaela a bit later in the talk. We also offer accredited courses, um, specifically in game ranging or field guiding, to be more correct, marine guiding as well, and wildlife management. So I've got the question, why volunteer? There's a plethora of reasons that um, people choose to volunteer but what we find are the most common ones are that people really want to gain experience and skills. They want a more immersive experience. I think for a lot of people, gone are the days of going to the beach and just lying on the beach for a week. People really want to be immersed. They want an authentic experience. We have a lot of students that use our experiences. Um, they get a certificate at the end of it and they use that to enhance their CV. A lot of students do our experiences to explore career paths. A lot of people volunteer with us just for the adventure of it and to learn and because they're interested in it. We also have people using it as a sabbatical, professionals coming out and, and they're wanting to do something different. And there's a big aspect of personal growth attached to this. It really does stretch one's comfort zone. 
And it's really wonderful because you're really helping to enrich the local communities, nature, wildlife, and you yourself are enriched through conservation. A question we get quite a lot is, if it's volunteering, why do I have to pay? And you are in fact not paying to undertake voluntary work, but there are a lot of costs attached to providing a safe, structured and supervised program. These costs are hosting our volunteers, 24 hour volunteer support, administration costs, communication costs, financial protection of your money, program inspections, transport, Accommodation and meals make up the bulk of it, staff support and upkeep of facilities, just to mention a few. And while the success of any volunteering operation depends on the presence of committed volunteers, our vital conservation and development work cannot be effectively achieved without expertise, plus the financial and administrative support. Volunteers are also essential to help continue project work during quiet seasons when there is typically less volunteer support. That brings me to the point of fundraising. Many of our volunteers and students that travel with us have actually fundraised towards their placements with us. And we have partnered with a company called Fund My Travel. They provide an online fundraising platform and we provide full support to our volunteers and students who want to fundraise. We send videos, pictures, posters, information, whatever they need to, to give it their best shot. We have often had volunteers raise in excess of their program fees so that they're able to cover their, their program fees, their flights and the excess is then they're able to then donate that to the project on the, on the ground. We also have school groups traveling with us from abroad and they often attach a fundraising component to, to the trip where the students have to, as a group, fundraise towards the nonprofit on the ground. And that's also part of the skills that they learn through doing fundraising campaigns. So how does it all work when you decide to volunteer with us? Firstly, we help you select the best project for you we give you a phone call, we chat with you, and we understand what your goals are. And then when you're ready to book, you pay your registration fee to secure your placement. And then we send you a very comprehensive preparation guide. We hold your hand every step of the way so that you can get fully prepared for your experience. We also work with flight and travel insurance partners, making for a seamless pre-trip experience. And once you arrive at the project, there's no previous experience or qualifications that is necessary. Um, our program coordinators will teach and train you on all the volunteering tasks that you will be doing. Now, we also understand that a lot of our travelers are first time travelers. So we really take it upon ourselves to go that little extra bit further and hold your hand throughout the entire process. In this image is one of our ambassadors, Sally. Sally joined us. Um, she was a first time traveler for Vets Go Wild. Sally's also a vet nurse. And later on, she then volunteered with us at the Rhino Orphanage. And being a first time traveler, she was naturally a bit nervous. And I think her testimonial speaks to the fact that when you travel with us, we really do hold your hand every step of the way. Many of our volunteers also wanna become ambassadors once they have completed their, their placements with us. And the great thing about this is that they're not only an ambassador for worldwide experience, but more importantly, they're ambassadors for conservation. As an example, Sally continues to fundraise from the UK for conservation and communities in Africa. And she was inspired by her trips to Vesco Wild and the Rhino Orphanage. That takes me on to the Rhino Orphanage. The Rana Orphanage uh, is based in Mpumalanga in South Africa. Its, um, its name is Care for Wild, and it's the largest Rana Orphanage in the world. And what's really great about this Rana Orphanage is that it's not a tourist attraction. The only way to gain access to this place is to volunteer and to get your hands dirty. They're very strict about their security, protecting the rhinos, and they really do run a tight ship over there. So you might be wondering where all these baby rhinos come from. Sadly, the current rhino poaching crisis is responsible for leaving behind many orphaned rhinos who would not make it out 
out in the wild without human intervention. Just in the southern part of Kruger National Park alone, there are about 300 rhinos poached on average every year. And often these are females with calves at foot. And if these calves are not killed, they just get left behind, afraid, hungry, often injured and unable to fend for themselves. So the rhino orphanage was set up to provide specialist care for these traumatized and injured baby rhinos. As a volunteer, you get involved with the rehabilitation work and this includes feeding them, monitoring, treatments and care for the rhinos and also the other wildlife that, that live at the center. We have also hosted high school groups at the Rhino Orphanage and several of our other projects as well. And this provides for a school expedition or service trip that is out of the ordinary and just super meaningful. We work closely with the tutors and schools to provide a service trip that supports and complements the work. And what's really great about, about getting involved in this work is the personal growth. We really see students coming out of their shells, gaining an interest in the world, gaining an interest in the natural world and taking it a step further once they get home. The next project I wanna talk about is in Zimbabwe in Victoria Falls. From 2012 to 2016, I spent much of my time in Victoria Falls setting up the Nakavango Conservation Program. Now, our ambassador, Daniel, will be speaking about the ongoing volunteer program a bit later on in today's talk. But in the meantime, I wanted to tell the story of how we used volunteer ecotourism to overcome some major challenges to carry out specific and necessary wildlife operations. The first was a task of darting the whole rhino population on the reserve for the purposes of ear notching and dehorning. And the second was that the reserve, the reserve's elephant population was becoming too big and we needed to move some elephants off and we identified that 10 bulls needed to be moved off and we secured permission to get them translocated to a national park in Zimbabwe. So just to provide some context, the reserve is relatively small by African standards. It's less, just less than 4,000 hectares. And also strange for that part of Africa is that the reserve is fenced. And the reason for this is that the, the reserve was declared an IPZ, an intensive protection zone for the black rhino population there. And at that stage, these were the last black rhino population in the entire Victoria Falls region, at least for a hundred kilometer radius. And then that was also because of the poaching crisis in, in Africa. And this is why the reserve is fenced to be able to monitor and better protect the rhinos. And so the elephants couldn't move freely out of the area and their growing numbers needed to be intensively managed. And we wanted to do this without culling. So these sort of operations are very logistically challenging and expensive to carry out. So what we did was set, a, set aside set dates where volunteers could join for these specific operations. And really that's a once in a lifetime opportunity for them. The only catch was that they had to raise double the normal program fee, which they actually gladly did for this experience. And by doing this, we managed to cover nearly 100% of the costs associated with these procedures. Having the volunteers on the ground also meant extra hands on support. And they assisted with all sorts of tasks like spraying the sedated animals with water to keep them cool, photographing the feet of the rhinos so that I could build an ID kit based on their tracks, checking the temperature throughout the procedure, which generally means being based at the rear end with a thermometer, keeping the elephant trunks open, making sure they're still breathing, helping to clear vegetation for the crane and the truck to reach the darted elephants, looking out for other wildlife and elephants that may approach out of curiosity, scribing, and we even had some qualified vet nurse volunteers who were tasked with operating veterinary equipment like the oximeters. It really was a hands-on experience where everyone had to pull together as a team, and many of the volunteers are still friends today and still remain in contact with us and with the team in Vic Falls. All, the, all these wildlife procedures went off successfully we successfully moved 10 bulls to a national park a few hundred kilometers away from the Nakavango program. 
and we managed to dehorn the rhinos. So everything went well and they were very smoothly run operations. At this point, I'm going to be handing over to our ambassadors. Michaela Vinales will now chat about her experience at Vets Go Wild. Michaela is a qualified and registered vet nurse from Kent in the UK. And afterwards, Daniel Borley, who has volunteered twice at Nakavango, is going to be chatting about his experience volunteering there in Vic Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. Okay, perfect. So, um, like Taryn says, um, I'm just going to talk to you about the Vets Go Wild trip that I went on. Um, so, to start with, um, the Worldwide Experience team have been excellent throughout my travel when I went on to the Vets Go Wild. Now, um, I went in 2017 as a nurse student, and the whole time from start to finish, they were very supportive. Um, when I first inquired about doing the course, um, I was very nervous because I was going to be a solo flyer. I had never flown anywhere before on my own, and obviously I was very apprehensive. Um, but they immediately put me at ease and um, they explained how they'd be with us through the start from the very beginning to when we landed back in the UK. The application process itself was very straightforward and I was in constant communications with them and they answered any questions that I had, even if I thought they were stupid, they just answered them no matter what. Um, I was obviously then petrified to go on the flight, but prior to actually getting on the plane, the uh, Worldwide Experience team let us know the other students that were going to be joining us, and I managed to get in contact with one of them, and we met up at the airport, so it put me much more at ease knowing that there was someone there already on the plane that I knew they, who they were and that they were going to be joining me for the 16 days. Um, and because they were a really good a team, I knew that I'd be traveling with them many, many more times in the future. And I still am to this day, still traveling with them. The team themselves, they're so passionate in everything that they do. Um, they thrive to make sure that each and every participant that they have, have an amazing time on the actual experience itself. But not only that, they make sure that they're happy with the means that getting to the country, whether that's South Africa or Namibia or anywhere else, they make sure that you're happy and that you, you haven't forgotten anything. If it's a visa, they make sure that that's all sorted. And obviously they have such a passion for wildlife itself and it's portrayed in every experience that they do. And even every conversation you have, they always include something about conservation in it. Now, um, Vets Go Wild itself, it's, um, an experience for vets and vet nursing students along with qualified and it's a chance to work with the very best team out there and you get hands on with wildlife from day one. It's based in the Eastern Cape um, near Port Elizabeth and when we arrived in 2017 after a very long 12 hour flight and we were greeted by one of the worldwide experience members Claire with a very very smiley face at race. And we then um, met our team and then we headed off to Amakala Game Reserve where we were based. Um, I could talk all day about um, the Vets Go Wild trip, but we don't have time for that. So I'm just gonna briefly explain a couple of the things that we did while we were out there. Um, it included things like relocation of different species such as antelopes, um, giraffes, wildebeest, zebras, we also got a chance to change the tracking collars on elephants and rhinos. Um, we even got to treat a lion, a wounded lion, while it, they were out there. And obviously we had to be aware of the pride that was around. So you just had to focus on the male, but think about the others as well. We went to uh, Algoa Bay Marine Park where we, my group did a dolphin dissection. And we also went on a boat to see uh, penguins and whales and dolphins. Obviously, we're in South Africa, so it meant there were lots of game drives, uh, morning sunrise ones, sunsets, and the skies out there are absolutely beautiful. And we also got to go on a helicopter where we uh, used a paintball gun and fired at the game viewer. They had a target at the back, and we got to um, shoot the moving vehicle, which was really fun. Um, throughout the whole trip, so the 16 days, the actual team out there, so Dr. William and Dr. Emily and Candice, so they're the Vets Go Wild 
bets out there, they made sure that the experience itself was life changing. Their knowledge of veterinary aspects was brilliant. And obviously as a vet nurse, well student at the time, obviously other students out there, that's key to make sure that the vet staff themselves know what they're talking about. But they're also very knowledgeable in the endangered animals and what we are doing, how that will help the wildlife itself. So if it's um, changing a tracking collar on a rhino, obviously it's so that the anti-poaching team know where that rhino is at all times. If we were dehorning a rhino, it's to prevent them from hopefully being not being poached. Um, lions as well, keeping an eye on the pride. The other thing is, yes, there were lectures, but obviously we had to know about the different drugs and what we were using and the things that we were doing, how that was gonna help the animal. The veterinary skills out there, you learn very quickly how to do IV lines and how to monitor animal under sedation. And obviously the team themselves, they knew that we were only training. So they weren't expecting us to know everything. And they were very good at showing us how to do certain things and understood that we were still students and we didn't know what we were doing. So throughout they were really reassuring and excellent with what they were doing. And every day we were guaranteed to touch some sort of animal. So like I said, whether it was a lion or a rhino or an elephant or a sable antelope, there was something out there that we would do. Um, some of my highlights, obviously it's, it's really hard to pick. Um, the 16 days that were out there, we did so much that the whole 16 days would be my highlights. Um, but I guess a couple of them would include touching my first ever rhino. I mean, not many people get to say they've touched a living dinosaur. Um, it did make me cry the first time I touched a rhino and still to this day when I do it, it feels like the first time I've ever touched one and it, it's very different, very surreal. Obviously touching a lion as well, very dangerous animal, not many people do that either. The um, helicopter experience, like I said, was very good. It, um, even though we were firing paintball guns at a moving vehicle it's what will and emily do with a live animal and a dart so it makes you think about the distance that they have to shoot it and the accuracy they need to have in order to get the animal to fall asleep so that we can then go and do what we need to do with it the friendships that you make now when i went on it there were 17 of us 16 vet students and me as the only nurse um a lot of them now are my very best friends. Obviously, once COVID is over, I'll be meeting up with them. Um, and honestly, you, you keep these friendships forever and you see a lot of them and obviously you add them on Facebook and you see what they're up to. But ultimately, I'd say from my Vets Go Wild experience, I then got to become an intern for three months once I qualified. So I got to go back out there and relive my dream. Um, I would never have ever been able to do that if I didn't do the Vets Go Wild trip. And I guess a lot of people can say how things are life changing. But for me, the Vets Go Wild trip was actually life changing. Um, it made my dream come true, first of all, to go out and touch and work with wildlife. Um, and But by attending it, it made my confidence as a nurse much, much better. I blossomed during it. Before the course, I was very, very shy. I didn't have any self-confidence. But when I returned home, I was a very different person. I, um, like I said, I managed to gain an internship while I was out there. And um, they asked me to come back for three months. And to be honest, I thank Worldwide Experience for that because if they didn't take me on the Vets Go Wild trip, I wouldn't have been asked to go back to South Africa and live my dream. So again, thank you guys. It's, you're the reason why I went back out. Um, and while I was out there on my return, um, because I was a much more confident nurse and person, I actually gained two jobs. I got two job offers while I was out there from two different vet practices back in the UK. Uh, obviously, it's a very hard decision what vet practice to pick. Um, but ultimately, the one I chose um, was an independent practice. And they asked me to become practice manager along with being the head nurse. The, my now boss says the reason why he asked me was because when I returned from the Vets Go Wild trip, he saw how much more confident I was as a person and how that was the sort of person he wanted to be his partner to run a business. Um, so the day I landed from the Vets Go Wild trip, he kind of already knew that he wanted to ask me. 
but then it was until the internship that he actually asked me because he realized how much my confidence had grown from the experiences um now since south africa since i've been i've been able to express my love for wildlife in many different ways um i have encouraged a lot of veterinary professionals to go on the vets go wild trip i think when the next course is run hopefully next year I think it's number five or six people I've already told to go on it. And I think a couple have been already and I've got many more um, all signed up to go. And I've uh, managed to do a lot of talks in different schools about conservation and how we need to do something today about it. You know, um, us as youth, we can do so much now, but if we don't do something, our children or our grandchildren won't be able to do or see animals, you know, rhinos these days are becoming very extinct so if we don't do something our children itself they won't see these animals so i've managed to go out and talk to most of schools about it and we've done a lot of fundraising for different wildlife charities as well um but ultimately the vets go wild trip it it changed everything for me changed my confidence and um, i wouldn't be able to do this talk today i don't think if i didn't do the vets go wild trip because Believe me, I was a very shy person, um, but I was not forced, but I had to go and talk to people and get involved and become confident. And it's all because of the Vets Go Wild Trip. So honestly, if, if it's something you're into, I would definitely recommend doing it. Um, thank you for listening. I think I'll pass you over to Daniel now. Um, so thank you for that, Michaela. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll start by introducing just who I am. Um, I'm Daniel Borley. I've travelled with Worldwide a um, number of occasions now, um, and I've got the absolute pleasure of talking to you today about the Nakabango Conservation Programme. Um, Tara mentioned it in her past presentation, um, and so I'd just like to give a bit more detail on, on what that programme's about, um, what's at the heart of it, um, and, and how it's really been, been sort of an experience of a lifetime for myself and hopefully is for many people to come. Um, so I'll start by going through what, what NACA Van Gogh is. Um, the clue is in the title, it's a conservation program. Um, and it was founded in 2012. Um, and Taryn spent a lot of time there and, and worldwide really, they, they put their heart into the start of it and that, that ethos really flows through. Um, it's based at the Stanley and Livingston Ga Private Game Reserve um, in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe. Um, and it, it falls within the Kaza conservation area. So it's, it is, it's about 10 minutes away from the falls themselves, um, which is, I suppose, just sort of an added bonus, really, of, 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 of the location of this project. What's the, what's the aim of the project? I suppose that's, that's the first question I always get asked whenever I mention it really. So I've, I've put the focal point on there um, of, of what their main aim is. Um, but really the, there's a plan to that. So there's, I, I've, I split it down to three main focuses really. There's, there's the key species um, and the key species at Nakavango is the black rhino. However, that's not mutually exclusive. It's not a, it's not a one-off. Um, there are other key species there. There's, there's ground hornbills. They have uh, African hunting dogs, although they're more transient. It is the key species here are, are wide ranging, um, and it's a highly successful uh, place for breeding black rhinos. Currently, there's 11 on the reserve, um, and the photo there is of Shingu the bull. Um, he was reloc relocated to South Luanga in Zambia uh, in 2018. Um, and the biggest problem they have um, at Nakavango is actually they have too many rhinos, as they told me the first time, which is 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 true. But really, the truth is they, they've not got too many rhinos. They've just not got enough space. Four thousand hectares is enough for one roaming bull. Um, and so the breeding program is so successful, they keep producing males. Um, <laughs> But these are going back out into into wild populations and, and supporting and restocking those. The second one on there is habitat, and it, in my my experience, I, I think that's the one where Nakavango really focuses, and I think that's the most important. Um, the Stanley and Livingston Game Reserve um, was previously uh, it was farmed for teak, 
Um, and then it moved on to become a hunting concession and then reform became a now, now a game reserve. But 4,000 hectares doesn't seem like a large area, but across that area, you've got so many different habitats and, and different ecosystems all in play in such a small area, all sort of in, in microcosm. So you've got rocky high ground areas, you've got Kalahari sands, which really give it that rich soil that, that causes these teak forests to absolutely regenerate and keep going, although the, the teak there now is, is limited. Um, you've got a wetland area with a dam, open grasslands, and, and due to this, you have so many different species which all thrive here. So you have you have black rhinos, you have ground hornbills, multiple raptors, vultures, like I mentioned, the hunting dogs, sable, hyena, it's, it's almost in such a concentrate of species in this area. And that's, that is really the key focus is they, they know, they understand that you have to get this habitat right for the key species to thrive. There's, there's no point sort of just introducing these key species and just hoping that everything goes OK. You've got to get this habitat right. And that is that is where the focus is on the you fight the battles to win the war. And the third one on there is community. And this is something which I think Nakavango really, really understands is that from a from a reserve point of view, if the community aren't engaged and the community aren't supported alongside it, it makes everything else much harder. Volunteers, they come for two to 12 weeks. But the, the thing to remember is these, these people live here. This is this is their this is their land. This is their their space. So understanding that and the complexities of the problems which are faced, I think People sometimes can think, oh, it's okay, we, we just need more elephants or we need more runners. These back home sat in the UK, we I don't have an elephant come and and, and destroy destroy my fridge. And these people live off the land. There's, if you don't understand these problems and the, the issues there, then Nakavango knows that you'll never really solve them. So it, it is interesting integrating the community into this project. Um, it provides jobs, it helps with food production. Um, it's a knock-on. This is a knock-on effect. So, how do people get here? That's where Worldwide come in. Um, in uh, 2000, 2018, um, I, I packed my bag and, and off I went, and went through the Worldwide process of uh, sort of have, almost having, having my hand held, really. Um, and Worldwide do make it so easy, as, as Michaela's. Tes uh, testimonial to it as a, has proved it's it's knowing that worldwide understand how how this can be a challenge to some people um it's not easy these places are often remote but worldwide make it so simple um and at the heart of that is the shared beliefs and passion staff um of which i've had the pleasure of meeting most of now and you see how much how much work and effort goes in to making sure that these projects are not only successful and and fantastic opportunities for the people, but most importantly, and I think this is the most important one, is their projects you can trust. They're projects that you know you are going to make a difference. Nothing's worse for someone who's in, interested in conservation, wants to make a difference. Nothing is worse than going out to a project and then discovering that it's, it's not making the difference you hoped it was, or even worse, it's making the detrimental effect. So that is really the reliability, the gold star, the gold star on there is you know these projects can be trusted. Um, they've been they've been founded, they've been vetted, they've been so much due diligence has gone into these projects. How do you make a difference? You get to Nakavango, you're in Victoria Falls, what, what's, the, what's the project going to do to make a difference to what's around? And I see that in three different ways. There's the direct impacts. Now, I'll, I'll go through these in a second, a bit more detail of what they are at Nakavango. But to me, a direct impact, you wake up in the morning, you go out to work, you, you stand there at the end of the day and you say, I can see that's different. I've made a change there. I can see what I've done. That is the, that is the instant difference. You've got the wider impacts. These take a bit longer, 
they're not so direct. They're, they're more the knock-on effects, the people, the community, the longevity. And then you've got the legacy impact. Um, and that is what I see that as what you take away. The changes to your life after you move away from Nakavango, once you get back home, wherever that may be. Um, the people you see after that. And the differences you make to your life, I, I see that's the legacy. So direct impacts from Nakavango. I never realized until I went to Nakavango how much work goes into maintaining a reserve. So not, not setting up a reserve, not moving a reserve, expanding its boundaries, just maintaining, holding still, keeping, keeping going, keeping head above water. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And Nakavango, for one, still fighting the legacy issues there. There's alien vegetation to be removed, uh, Datura, Lantana. There's road maintenance. And I think people can sometimes think, oh, road maintenance, how much of a difference am I really making? But it's, it's not just so guests don't spill their gin and tonics when they're going around the reserve. It's if you've got an anti-poaching issue the other side, a reserve you go down a road that you know is there and you can't get through that slows you up that can be the difference so small changes small differences that's where that's where the work really is the soil erosion works uh, game count surveys transects snare checks uh, animal animal rehabilitations help there um, it the list is really endless and it depends what comes in every day but the way it was always explained to me is every pound they don't have to spend on paying someone to do these, do the road maintenance, do this work. That's another, that's another pound that goes towards paying for a vital member of staff, go paying towards equipment um, for anti-poaching. That is anti-poaching staff as boots on the ground. The wider impact. So the wider impact of Nakabango, and I think everyone will take something different away from that. I think the community projects, there's, you spend one day at the local school. Um, you see, you see how the children there, what's important to them, and you you spend time with them, and you try and pass on that message. And I think that's that's important. If people see that you care, um, I think that's infectious. There's local jobs. I've I've made friends there, who I still speak to now. Um, so there's a photo there. There's the two of the two of the chefs who still speak to on regular regular basis over in Zimbabwe um, and then you've got things like the vegetable patch so that's uh, that is food production that is having somewhere that people can go and get food if they if they need if they want food or fresh vegetables there's a source there and that's at the school that's at that's at Nakavango for the staff and that's a it's a big part of, of the giving back and then there's the legacy, what you take away, what you pass on after you leave. And this is the the, the one that then lasts for, for lifetimes and gets passed on. I think it's the care you have over your local wildlife once you get back home. Um, I've certainly made different changes since I've come back from, from my first visit. It was I came back and all of a sudden I, I see insects around and the importance they have and what can I do to help support them in the local local um, local environments? There's other trips I've been on. So at the start of the year, as far away as that seems now, I was over in Mauritius with Worldwide, a new project there. Um, and again, not something once you've once you've had a taste of this, it's it's hard to it's hard to ever go back. Really, you never. It's difficult to then travel and think, do you know what? I, I don't want to just go down the sun lounge. I want to go do something different. I want to go and get my hands dirty and get, get involved. Um, and it, it's that connection to the community. To me now, Big Falls is something I, I'll always keep an eye out for. Zimbabwe, a country I have no family connection to whatsoever, but it's got a place in my heart and I'll, I'll always keep an eye out for it. And it's it fills me with joy when I when I meet someone over in the UK who who is from Zimbabwe and be able to share share stories. So what do you get back? What do you get back from from going on one of these trips, going out to Zimbabwe or wherever? I thought, from what I got back, adventure, camping out in the African bush, something I never thought I'd do, rafting down the Zambezi again, 
someone said to me sort of just six months before this what you're going to be doing I, I think no chance so it's that sense of adventure that you you rarely ever get experience I, I can say I've tracked lions on foot I've been on a, a night drive around a, a reserve that being part of a team being part of preserving that part of that special part of this planet and then most importantly education i think this is what makes the biggest difference to me dean mcgregor and justine the two people that run there dean is one of the most incredible people i've ever met in my life um he runs nakavango with his wife justine and he has spent years working as a pro guide in zimbabwe and he's forgotten more than I will. I, I've forgotten more than he'll. He he sort of he's ever learned. He's he's forgotten more than I've ever learned. He's he knows so much, and his passion for the smallest things, the plants, the insects, the birds. That's that is so infectious, and you carry that away. And it, it is learning about the small small things, the little things. Not focus on the big the big things. And that, that is the biggest lesson I took away is from a saying we have over in the UK, the sweat, the small stuff. It's all about the little things. That's what makes the difference. When I first went out to Africa, I was excited about seeing lions, elephants, rhinos. I soon learned that it's the trees and the insects, the soil, the birds. That's, that's what makes this habitat. And it's all carefully intertwined. And that, that makes it so fascinating. By learning about these small things, you learn about the big things. So, what excites me is is the balance of the ecosystem. You can you can introduce a, a big name species, an endangered endangered animal, but if you don't get the habitat right, it's futile. So, Dean's work was all on is are the bird populations healthy? Are you seeing the right raptors? Are you seeing are you seeing are you getting the right trees come through? Are they being able to they're being able to spawn every year. Are you are you getting more shoots? Are these trees he he'll never see, but that's what he cares about is seeing these these come through. And I think listening is is the key because you listen to these people, listen to these guys here, there, what they know, and it really will change your life. You become aware of wider issues. Um. Uh, there were so many things that seem so cut and dry and so simple when you're sat thousands of miles away. But once you get immersed in these and you understand the problems, that kind of education to people around the world, that really makes a change. And it's all about listening to the local people. The heart, they're the people at the heart of this. And I look at ourselves in the UK and it's something which I spent a lot of time looking at when I first, first got there. And I thought, well, our wolves are gone and we've we've chased extinct beavers out of our country we've reintroduced them and they've started to come back but wild boar we've we've managed to wipe from the uk twice marsh harriers went extinct ospreys no longer found breeding in the uk until recently and being reintroduced so so who's really best place to say this is the best way to do this and it is the local people they, these people understand the problems and I certainly think people in, our, in other countries, in my country, we need to look at ourselves, really. And we don't want to make these same mistakes twice. And it's helping. But understanding the people there, they're the people with, with the, they're the people with the key to unlock this. Life enrichment. And I, I promise when you, if you went to, if you go to the reserve, I, in your the intrinsic value of things changes so much. It's not your aspirations of that they change. It's, it goes away from material items, money. What you, what you start to focus on and what becomes important to you are such smaller things. It's it's just local. It's a stream. It's seeing the sunset. It's it's seeing animals thrive and flourish. They're the things which you really see a value in. And although there's hard work involved in going to a reserve and, and getting your hands dirty and doing this, and people might think oh, it's, it's two weeks of hard work and I work hard and I don't, do I want to go and do this? It is not. And I'm always sort of uh, reminded of, of for say, if you do what you love, you'll never work another day in your life. And that is so true. If you're 
if you're out on the reserve, seeing these things making the difference, it, it never feels like work. Um, and I think my, the best thing I can give as a testimony to Nakavango is there's on the reserve, there's, there's a five-star hotel um, on the reserve over the uh, sort of not far away from the sort of the accommodation and I can say with my hand on my heart I'd rather stay at Nakavango than in that hotel any day and I think that's that's really what makes a difference I think seeing other people who would all share that opinion who have been there would rather stay there any day that that's, that really shows what what special place Nakavango is um, and and I suppose finally my, my thanks to Taryn um, for for sort of introducing me to this and 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 helping me see this and to Paul and Adrian as well for your part. So I'll I'll pass you back to Taryn um, to to finish off. Great. Well, thank you, Michaela and Daniel. That was um, uh, very inspiring to listen to you. And what I hope everyone has kind of gathered from your testimonials about your experiences with us and on, on the ground in, in Africa is, first of all, how life-changing it is for our travelers themselves and the fact that we adopt this holistic approach. So it's not just about the wildlife. We really integrate the conservation with the education and with the community and, and sustainability of everything as well going forward. Um, and for our travelers, it's it's just an immersive, richer experience. You're not paying to see the animals. You're not paying you, you're not paying to see the animals, but rather to help the animals. You gain an in-depth understanding of what goes on behind the scenes and you get to be involved in such a hands-on way. And you're not just watching the experts do everything. You're the one that gets to operate the te telemetry, tracking equipment. You're the one observing the wildlife and recording the data and helping to actually fix the roads and do the bush cleaning and planting trees, filling up all the milk bottles for the rhinos at the rhino orphanage. You know, it's just so hands on. And I think, you know, a big thing that you touched on there, Daniel, is the, the community aspects of it and, and you know, how it makes me think of a conversation we were having at Mantis this week, how Africa is the conservation continent. Um, and there's such opportunity for, for innovation over here. And, you know, we work very closely with our in-house um, foundation at Mantis called the Community Conservation Fund Africa. And they've been, they've got some incredible projects, very inspiring. And um, we work closely with them as well. And like I always say to the school groups when I do conservation talks for them as well, you don't need to be a conservationist to be a conservationist. And they go, huh? And what I mean is everyone has their own calling and passions, but no matter what work we do, we can all be a conservationist on some level. So it's about the way we live our life and it's about respecting the planet and spreading awareness and just doing our small bit, whether it's composting or recycling at home. Daniel, I loved your insect hotel that you built at home when you got back from Nakavango. Um, that's very, very inspiring. Um, you know, just becoming more of a conscious consumer, supporting wildlife charities, carpooling, whatever it is, we can all commit to doing something meaningful, no matter how small or insignificant it may feel. And, um, you know, at Worldwide, we're just really passionate about growing this, this worldwide conservation community, where we're just all about taking this planet forward in a sustainable way. And lastly, I just want to thank, thank everyone. I hope you've been inspired. Maybe you didn't realize that these sorts of travel opportunities existed. And if you would like to volunteer, whether it's as a solo volunteer or as a group of friends or even as a family um, or a school, college, university group, we've also got corporates who travel with us and, and they look for a meaningful team building experience that incorporates social responsibility. If you're interested in doing anything like this at all, please do reach out to us. And 
thank you for taking the time to join in tonight. Thanks so much to my team for being here and helping to Adrian and Paul. Um, LCA, thank you so much for this opportunity. Michaela and Daniel, thanks for sharing. Um, my heart is just swelling after hearing your testimonials. And just a general shout out to all the volunteers who have helped us already to make a real impact for wildlife conservation.